I know that Ed has to leave a couple of minutes before four because he's teaching at four. So if um, anyone in the audience has um, uh, questions specifically for, for him, I, we should give them priority. And then we'll have a, an additional round or two of questions for the rest of the panelists. So any questions for uh, Ed Glazer? My name is Yvan Rossignol. I'm with the World Bank. I actually uh, chaired a panel on which you were at the World Bank two years ago. And so it's great to, to hear you again. I was very interested in the typology that you have of cities and the ones that, uh, I forgot the word, uh, nim nimism, I think. Nimism. Not in nimism. my backyard, isn't it? OK. <laughs> OK, thank you. And, and, the, and, and the gigantic ones uh, a la China, I guess. My question to you is about India. India has decided to set up, uh, or at least to create 500 uh, new cities. And the way they go about it is in terms of, uh, for expediency purposes, basically, they're giving the management and, and basically the contract to, to, uh, to, to build these cities to the private sector. And the private sector, the way to do this in a very efficient manner is to build very high-level, high-rise buildings with, with a service utility or utility delivery that is not exactly uh, at par with, with the needs. So what, are, what is your views of that? And, and uh, I mean... Are we really deciding on the type of cities that we're creating today? You know, my, I have mixed views about the Smart Cities Initiative in India. On one level, the problems are enormous. Um, the energy of the private sector of entrepreneurship from, you know, from the Tatas down to Dharavi is enormous, and it seems like leveraging that is worthwhile. On the other hand, and some of these smart cities may end up being quite successful, on the other hand, in many ways, it doesn't seem well suited to the, to the current needs of, of, Indian, of Indian urban populations or would-be urban populations. So I think experimentation is, is worthwhile. But I think when I think about what India needs, I mean, in the sort of macro level urban, urban policy, it's about having more power and initiative at the local level. So the Indian model is one in which state governments are extremely empowered. They've traditionally had you know, over-representation of rural districts, sometimes by as much as 15 to 1 in Karnataka versus you know, rural Karnataka versus, versus Bangalore. Um, and we've seen really impressive things that have come through the empowerment of Delhi. So the creation of Delhi as an independent city-state, um, which have, have enabled it to innovate in ways that are completely denied to Mumbai which sort of labors under the control of the Maharashtra government, which really limits its ability to innovate. So while, I mean, I think, you know, God bless the Modi government for caring about cities and for trying to do something about it, but I think doing things that which create more ability of the cities to take control of their own destinies would be a big plus. And I think also just to highlight other things which are really sort of central in, in cities, again, getting back to sort of the agenda of dealing with the downsides of density. I think we really need to find a way in which we nudge people towards behavior that doesn't create negative externalities in ways that are humane. And my, my current, since this is my current hobby horse, I'm going to push it. So there's a problem of open street defecation in India. Uh, it's a non-trivial health issue. Um, there are economists, there are social scientists who think that we can change the culture around open street defecation. And, and you know, I hope they can. But the normal way we handle open street defecation is with some sort of punishment. But of course, we don't trust the cops to punish, punish people a lot of the time. And we don't trust that they'd be fair about it or humane about it. So I'm pushing an agenda where kids who engage in open street defecation need to be punished by doing math problems or reading in a community center for an hour. So I think the light and benevolent punishment of children is, is my current agenda for Indian, for Indian cities. <laughs> Excellent. Can I just say a couple things in response to that? We have a team that's actually down in three of the U.S. cities that have been uh, the U.S. partnership with Modi on the smart cities. I, we have real biases about this. The biggest fear is that these large companies will create off the rack smart cities technology products that don't reflect the needs of the citizens. And that the biggest failure, the, the worst fear, is they do really large scale solutions that then cannot be sustained locally. That there's no local match to support the maintenance of those new, new technologies and that there's no talent who can use the system after the companies come in. And so we have been very much focused on a process working with citizen leaders and nonprofits to make sure there is resident leader, local voice and participation with the states in those and that it's driven by sort of a, a, a local plan. You know, I know, I know the city, I know Modi has been trying to create those uh, capacities for that, but I, I think you are right to raise questions about that approach. May I add to that too? So we, we also work uh, in, in India a little bit, particularly in the slums of Mumbai and Pune, which are actually quite different realities. Mm -hmm. Mumbai is very dense. Pune is actually a city that's very interesting. 
it's less dense, which makes the logistical problem much easier. The main problem is sanitation, but also in some sense regularization of land uses and so forth. And uh, the solution in Pune, because it's possible and because of the big push in India towards sanitation, is that every person will have a private toilet, which not only solves the problems that already were brought up, but it's really a much bigger problem. It's a problem of dignity, of safety, particularly for women and children. And it's also, you know, it touches on, on many other aspects that are important beyond sort of the immediate issue. So uh, I think that we've, so, but the, the point about this is that we, we have not had good urban planning on a massive scale Mm -hmm. according to the models you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We have a, a long history of that now, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. However, I think we, what we, we all could say here in this panel is that we have a much better understanding of cities, both in terms of data, but also in terms of practices, in terms of community organization, mm -hmm. in terms of census that are being done, both officially and through neighborhood nonprofits, that allows us to have a much better picture of incremental solutions, mm -hmm. that allows us to open space, to move neighborhoods, you know, slowly but surely into a path of actually being serviced, having dignity, having emergency services, being more resilient. And that is now been proven possibly possible. And, and so it's a question of actually showing that that it provides a better solution than sort of a brute force approach on a large scale that probably won't last a few decades. Great. And um, any more questions? Uh, let's start over there and go leftwards. Thank you all for this wonderful panel. Uh, when we think about inequality, we usually uh, think of income. Uh, but this disregards a key fact, as my classmate Larry Summers points out, and, and that is that in almost, in most product categories, prices have declined and quality has improved hugely in the last 20, 30, 50 years, whatever. Home appliances, automobiles, software, accounting services, you name it. Uh, a, t a television in 2016 is far superior to uh, uh, one in 1986. Uh, he, he does distinguish between politically inflected and non-politically inflected, as he calls them, product categories. And he says that in the politically inflected ones, like uh, uh, health care, food, and education, this effect has not enjoyed uh, as many benefits, but those are still at least in the developing wor developed world in the minority. Beautiful example, the cell phone is, is, was only available to the very wealthy 20 years ago. Uh, well, if you include this, new, this kind of wealth that all of us enjoy, uh, my guess is that inequality has actually declined rather than increased. Uh, and in fact, globally, even if you don't consider it, just looking at incomes, with China and India catching up to Europe and North America, inequality has declined, I think, by most measures. Uh, even if you look in, at just geopolitical regions like North America, we see Mexico enjoying many of the same products and services that, North, that Canada and the U.S. now enjoy, and, and so even they, we see uh, inequality declining there. So my question is, why don't we include this rapidly in increasing universal wealth in calculations of inequality? Is it because it's hard to quantify and incorporate it into models? If so, how can or should we incorporate it? Or two, is it because what matters to us is not absolute wealth, but relative wealth? And if so, what role does envy play? Uh, should education of the social harm of envy uh, be part of any solution? <laughs> And are we helping to create envious societies wittingly or unwittingly by focusing on relative rather than absolute wealth? Well, who wants to take that? So I, I can actually add some facts on this, and then I'll walk out the door. Um, so first of all, I, I'm totally on board with the view that envy is a deadly sin, not a sound basis for public policy. Um, secondly, <laughs> the point about sort of global inequality, the Javier Sally Martin fact, is, is broadly correct. Third, the fact about product category, uh, separate income, income, se separate price increases is not correct. So the, at least in terms of retail products, the work of Javier Jarvel, who is a student of ours, has shown actually that over the past 15 years, if you take into account the different product mix consumed by different, different income groups, you find actually that inflation has been highest uh, for products consumed by the poor and lowest for products consumed by the rich. So in fact, embedding the retail price uh, CPI 
corrections actually makes inequality widen within the U.S., not decrease. I've never seen any comparable work done globally. If you broaden it towards areas like housing, which doesn't involve retail trade, the situation becomes considerably more complicated, and the key debate is between Rebecca Diamond, also a student of the economics department, and Enrico Moretti. So Moretti shows that sort of just on a very broad level, the housing price increases have been steeper in areas where rich people live more, which has the balancing effect that you discuss. Um, Rebecca Diamond shows in a more sophisticated model that once you take into account differences in amenities across places and different, different valuations of amenities, that that effect is muted or even reversed in the sense that the, the richer areas are also getting nicer uh, a lot and the valuation of them is getting nicer. So it's, so it's complicated and I think the complication is the reason why we don't actually typically, typically embed it. Do you want to ask one more question on my, on my way out and then I'll, then I'll, then I'll go? If, they, if you have the time, I'll do, I'll do, one, we'll do one more. <laughs> yes, the, of course. The, uh, so let's take one more. Um, yeah, over here. Thank you. It has been stressed, the, the factor of the execution, at the level of cities. I was wondering, after all I've heard these days, if there is any model that can predict the competitions that have mayors have to execute. If there is some work in this field. That's for you. <laughs> I'm sorry, can you repeat the question about the mayors? Yes. Uh, um, it has been stressed that executing the models or the, or the uh, models or systems ideas is important. So I wonder if there is a way of predicting the, the competences for executing in mayors. A city seems to be a, <laughs> such a an, an relevant. So, um, so on this one, I think that one of the beauties about cities um, is that I think increasingly is that we don't always have to rely on the mayors. I think someone said leadership really matters. Political leadership absolutely matters, as we heard from the former mayor of Medellin. Um, but if you have a weak mayor, other leadership can emerge. And so um, what I would say is political leadership is absolutely critical for setting the right objectives, for convening people to solve solutions. You were talking so much effectively about how some of these most complex problems require just networks of, of people coming together to do systemic change. That takes, right, vision, uh, leadership um, to be able to do that. But I guess I, um, and I also find it in an environment where there's very little public resources now, that the mayors are doing it not because um, Creating a lot of these solutions require engaging more private sector and other nonprofits and other philanthropy to leverage and bring resources to the solutions. And so um, I think the mayors today are understanding the importance of all of these uh, cross sector um, partnerships to create solutions. But that said, I think what we're seeing now is a real demand for other civic institutions to step up. More uh, civic institutions, more public-private partnerships, um, and, and others to really fill the gap uh, in a lot of the challenges in our cities. Thank you. So we have time for like maybe a couple of follow-up questions, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, we will give a chance. So over here, OK. And then there, Daniel. Just wanted to ask the panel about uh, BRTS systems. They seem to have been successful in most part, uh, wherever they have been tried. Mm. How come it has not gained great attraction all over the world? Randomized control. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, bus rapid transit systems, yes. dedicated bus. lanes. Well, arguably they are spreading. They're yes. even now ex uh, being implemented in LA and other places. So. Um, there's sort of an incremental solution, right? That's what's really attractive about it. They go from basically something that's easy to add to with a few more buses. The, the, the critical thing that even speaks a little bit to technology and, and other aspects of it is that by creating dedicated corridors, by creating platforms that reduce the time for ingress and outgress, by creating sort of a, a system of fares that allow you, it works in a way that's faster and also allows you to dispatch and control in a way that guarantees better quality of service. So it's those interesting innovations, actually not the buses themselves, that make the whole system as a system work better. And you see that, you know, short of building sort of a, um, um, a subway line, but having a better bus system that really is filling that gap. When I was a PhD student here, I got my PhD in mathematics at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, 80s. The word inequality didn't exist mm -hmm. in the American society. Mm -hmm. 
it exists today. Something had happened. Mm -hmm. Whichever it is, something happened here, Three. and it is related to inequality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Secondly, and for example, there is a deep inequality regarding fear in our society. It's unevenly distributed. If you want to talk about inequalities in many forms, many forms, and you have to take them into account. The Gini coefficient is one, but there are many other inequalities that we live in, in the society where we live and that would you live here. Mm -hmm. And finally, one example, which is, it is no, it hasn't any use in political terms to tell people that 200 years ago we were in this condition or 20 years ago we were in this condition. It doesn't help at all. Right. For example, with this health system in Colombia, mm -hmm. I have no doubt that the one that we have today is better than the one that we have 20 years ago, but nobody's studying what happened 20 years ago in order to decide or feel what they have to feel today. That's a way of missing the point and the political terms are very different. So there are very deep inequalities and we have to understand how to address those inequalities. And there is a one that has been there for all the time is in our society, which wasn't here and now it is here in this country, which is how you have a chance in this society to choose, to freely choose a path is associated directly to the richness of your family. And that remains very powerful in our society and we have improved because I believe that we have improved quite a lot but inequality is there, it changes, and we have to ask to work on that, and that has to be done at all different levels. We mayors can do some things, governors, we can do some things, and at the, in our contest, at the presidential level, we can do other things, but that's a political problem, it's a present problem, it's a real problem, it's an urgent problem, and we have to tackle it. Yeah, I, I would say that one of the reasons why cities are such good engines of growth is because they raise expectations. Mm -hmm. But also by raising expectations, they also raise this uh, feeling of frustration and inequality and... and, and, and right. Uh, right. Yeah. Can, can I just, I, you know, there are so many dimensions to this issue, um, but I want to just reinforce this, the, the challenge of the zip code, which people have been talking about. You know, last week our uh, organization released a report that showed that even in the height of this rebirth, uh, in the last five years in the United States, we have seen concentrated poverty continue to climb at astronomical levels in the United States. We now have 4,000 more neighborhoods in the country now that have high levels of poverty. And so if you have high levels of poverty, 20% or more, you're absolutely locked out of any kind of economic opportunity, good schools, jobs, and, and so on. And so we have not yet cracked the code about why is it that we have you know, uh, that neighborhood change is hard for everybody. So everyone talks about both increasing opportunities within cities and then also letting people in those neighborhoods access maybe more opportunity-rich neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Well, right now, the politics of trust and fear is people, both the opportunity-rich neighborhoods and the poor neighborhoods, both fear change. High poverty neighborhoods, right, worry that more investment is gonna gentrify them out. So they really resist new investments, even though if it may, it may improve their outcomes. We want middle class neighborhoods to increase affordable housing. People who live in those neighborhoods also don't want change. They don't want to see diversity in their neighborhoods. Somehow we need to figure out a way. This is where you could have as much good policy as you want, but our you know, personal biases and our relationships with one another are really inhibiting good intentions to work.